Good evening. My name is Lisa Sugimoto, and I'm one of the PPL consultants working with Saracoso College in their search for their next president. And welcome to all of you who are joining us for the third in the series of the forums to be introduced to the candidates who have made the final list for the president's position. Um, as we complete each forum, you are being asked to go to the Saracoso College website and uh, click on the presidential search button so that you can provide feedback and your input on each of the candidates. Uh, tonight's forums will be 50 minutes in length and there will be two introductory questions followed by questions submitted by the community. And to conclude, the candidate will spend the final five minutes providing a closing statement. And I will hopefully do my best to keep time. Um, and now I'm very pleased uh, to introduce you to Dr. Sean Hancock as one of the finalists for the Saracoso College President's position. And as he goes into the introductory questions, I'd like to go ahead and read both of them. So given the qualifications and characteristics we seek in our next president, as well as institutional strengths and challenges we face, would you please briefly describe your background and how that suggests propensity for success in this critical leadership position? The other question, after your first six months in this position, what criteria would you use to evaluate your effectiveness as our new president? Well, thank you very much, Lisa, I appreciate it. And it's such an honor to be here uh, this evening to speak to all of you so you can get to know a little bit about me and my experiences as they relate to those qualifications, characteristics, institutional strengths and challenges. So I'm gonna go through those that I felt most relevant and I'm gonna try to, to also keep time. <laughs> and so um, bear with me as I go through and try to highlight those, those various uh, um, characteristics and experiences that I've had. I'd like to start out with the qualifications. Um, one of the things, in, aside from my doctorate in educational administration from University of the Pacific, I want to highlight that I'm a California Community College graduate, that I graduated from College of the Sequoias in Visalia, California, that in the central San Joaquin Valley. Um, I'm also a graduate of Menachee High School in Porterville. You may recognize that as um, the location of one of your sister colleges. Uh, Currently, uh, I formerly served as Vice President of Instruction and Student Services with Palo Verde College. So I have that dual role experience and responsibilities. Um, currently, I'm Vice Chancellor of Student and Institutional Success for Grossmont Cuyamaca Community College District. That's a mouthful. Um, I support Ed Services, which is, again, both instruction and student services, uh, IT, uh, workforce and community partnerships, research, um, a lot. <laughs> and so I partner with uh, my staff and the college presidents and, and uh, uh, chancellor's cabinet to support the work going on at our two colleges. Uh, 20 years within the California community and junior colleges, that's both private and uh, public sector. And I'm a fifth generation Californian. Uh, so now I want to highlight some of the experiences that I think are most relevant to the great work that's taking place at Saracoso Community College. Um, first and foremost, um, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in all its forms. Uh, I'm on a personal and professional journey. Um, it, it's a commitment that I have um, of self-reflection, uh, dismantling the biases, um, that have been instilled in us uh, in society over generations and in coming to better understand where I fit in and what I can contribute um, to um, anti-racism. Um, I want to look for opportunity to support everyone in their personal journey as well as the institution's journey uh, in this regard. Uh, I'm a gay man, I have a disabled mother on public assistance, former foster youth, and I just say that, that even as a white male, I've experienced a number of, and overcome a number of the, the same challenges our students face at our colleges. And um, I recognize the power of education to improve lives. I want everyone to have the benefit of a college education. I know me personally, and I've seen it in those we serve, that sense of empowerment, that pride, the confidence, the sense of self-worth and validation they receive when they accomplish their educational goals. Graduation is um, one of those things that just recharges all of us right when they come up and they're just so excited about what they've done. They didn't think they could do it. So I, I, I love and that being a part of that 
and, and we need to do that for everyone. Um, I've attended numerous equity workshops and seminars, the RP groups, Strengthening Student Success Conferences, very powerful uh, sessions on microaggressions, currently participating in the Black Minds Matter uh, series that is being broadcast on YouTube, how to be an anti-racist, food insecurities, housing insecurities, all of these different challenges that our students are facing. I've hosted trainings on the campuses, uh, such as Ruby Payne's Bridges Out of Poverty, very powerful, it speaks to our middle class mindset and how we impose that on everyone when they may um, use a different set of rules for survival and we need to recognize that. I've brought out uh, doctors uh, Wood and Harris to talk about their book, Teaching Men of Color in Community Colleges. I've brought out speakers on AB 705 and multiple measures when that was being launched. Uh, student support uh, redefined um, had a speaker come out and talk about that and what it is that students are really looking for from us in order to be successful. I know that you've uh, also had that presented at, at Saracosa Community College. Uh, supported innovative approaches to transportation um, uh, and Blythe, very remote, small population. And then there was much more smaller populations, even more remote and rural uh, than Blythe. And we were working with local transportation um, companies to, to figure out ways in which we can bring students to and from campus. So we, we had some success in those partnerships and I'm proud to have done that work. Uh, collaboration, serve on the River Consortium Board. That's an adult education board uh, at Pellerin College. I developed a partnership with Fort Mojave Indian Tribe uh, for a culinary certificate. I've worked closely with the Needle Center director under uh, this River Consortium uh, to, in developing GED preparation on site, high school dual enrollment courses for CTE courses offerings. Uh, we, we renovated the facilities at the Needles High School, uh, their auto and their welding labs, brought them up to code so that we could use them in Needles as well um, uh, and offer those uh, programs. And then that also helped uh, bring in more dual enrollment and, and allow opportunities for the high school students in that small community. Um, Current board member of the East Region Adult Education Consortium, uh, part of Change Makers through the Foundation for Grossmont and Cuyamaca Colleges. I participate, advocate, and contribute funds to raise money for the Promise Program and all the various emergency student support services and grants. A regional Oversight Committee for our Regional Strong Workforce Partnership uh, Program, and we I help over uh, provide oversight for state and local grant opportunities and initiatives within our region. Um, East County Education Alliance, uh, that's a formal agreement between our, our two uh, feeder districts and our district. Um, we've done a lot of work around alignment um, and uh, college and career uh, prep um, and also uh, the Promise Program. We, through our partnership with them, we doubled our uh, Promise Program enrollment last fall over the previous fall. Uh, so lots of success in, in establishing that formal partnership. East County Economic Development Council, I participated on the Skilled Workforce Committee, General and Advanced Manufacturing Committee. I've developed a CCAP agreement for dual enrollment with Mountain Empire Unified School District, the first one with that district. We just got approved this last week. I've overseen partnerships between Palo Verde College and the Farm Workers Institute for Education and Leadership Development. Uh, you may be familiar with FIELD, Bakersfield has worked with FIELD. Um, through an ins and we had an instructional services agreement with them providing ESL education in rural communities. Um, I know that uh, Bakers CSU Bakersfield is also working with FIELD. Uh, oversaw an ISA with Industrial Emergency Council, which equated to roughly 25% of the FTES at, in Blythe at Palo Verde College. And that's providing continuing ed for fire workers up and down the state. So I was working with lots of districts to get their permission to offer those courses within their districts uh, through um, uh, that um, emergency council. Uh, expansion of inmate education once face-to-face -face became available. I worked with faculty and the prisons uh, to, to put everything into place to be able to offer those face-to-face -face courses. And I advocated at the state level as well um, and worked with wardens and principals. Um, we got that kicked off. We already had a very robust correspondence program there for many years. Um, that inmate education accounts for roughly 50% of the FTES at Palo Verde College. And I know that you've been steadily increasing your enrollment um, through inmate ed your inmate education program. So um, I've got a lot of experience in that area. Student engagement, I think it's important to highlight that. 
I reach out to student government and club representatives. I brought them in. I want them participating in the decision making and on our councils and committees. But beyond just having them there, you need to train them and, and let them know what it is we're working. They need to learn our language. Um, how do we function? So there's training that's involved with bringing them into those councils so that we're truly making decisions informed by the student perspective, a knowledgeable student perspective. Uh, standing meetings with student leadership, presence at events, and I think being accessible is one of the most important pieces with regard to student engagement. Uh, enrollment management, I've worked to develop a, a comprehensive enrollment management plan with Cambridge West Consulting um, to meet the specific needs of Palo Verde College because of the ISAs and the incarcerated student population, the limited feeder high schools. Um, having a distance center with needs very different from those at the main campus. These are all things I think resonate with Saracosa Community College. Uh, so I have experience working in that environment. Um, I currently work with cabinet to, to track enrollment weekly, looking at various metrics to identify any gaps in real time so that we can address those. I also have past experience in monitoring the enrollment pipeline, interest to application, application to appointment, whether that be financial aid or counseling, appointment to registration. These are things I know that are built in your, your metrics and your strategic planning and your uh, quality focus essay related to onboarding. So these are all things that I'm familiar with and used to working in. Uh, uh, working to, to advance and address where those gaps may be and how we can support student onboarding. Um, so how would I evaluate myself in the first six months? Um, one, I think I would have looked back to see that I established relationships with employees and students through Saracosa's expansive service area, getting to know people, really listening, and in doing so, contribute to a shared vision of how we can, our, um, to capitalize on existing strengths and, and create, um, develop new strengths in order to address those challenges facing our, our institution. Um, COVID-19 response. I mean, this is something that changes daily uh, sometimes. And so uh, how are we responding to that? Are we, um, have we worked with all the stakeholder groups to address the financial impact of COVID-19 while ensuring the sustainability of programs and services meeting the needs of our unique communities and mitigating those financial insecurities facing our students, especially during these unprecedented times? Uh, successfully picked up the mantle of prior leadership um, with respect to community building with education, age, other uh, local education institutions, government, business and industry sectors in promoting the success of our students and communities. And I will have worked with the various constituent groups in advancing the California Community College's Office's call to action, uh, working with faculty to um, identify ways to create an action plan around creating inclusive classrooms and anti-racism um, racism curriculum, reviewing our administration of justice, security, and EMT programs as well. So just looking for opportunities to advance um, student equity. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it's time to take questions. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so for the audience sake, let me let you know that we received several questions, quite a few questions, and um, we attempted to combine some of those questions that were very similar so that our candidates wouldn't have to answer the same questions in different ways. So we try to put them together. So if you don't hear your question exactly, we did attempt to make sure that those questions were included. Um, also, uh, the candidates may not answer all of the questions. Um, that's part of why we do it in a form uh, format. So we hope that they can and we will go ahead and get started with our very first community question um, now. So um, Dr. Hancock, please describe the style of leadership you seek to practice. From your experience, provide an example that successfully used that style as you engaged with your colleagues to get something done. I, I, say, I would say that I most resonate with um, the servant leader as a servant, a servant leadership. And Robert Greenlee did an essay on that back, I think it was 1971, but really it is about that an effective leader is there to s serve the interests of the institution and their colleagues. Um, if you support everyone else's success, if you are a servant to that, then you are a servant to the overall mission of your institution. And so I think that examples of that, I mean, you have to live that on a daily basis. You have to make sure you're engaging the various stakeholder groups. 
um, in, in coming up with initiatives, uh, ideas, approaches, um, being innovative, uh, looking for opportunities to make change. And I think that uh, you have to, um, it's that engagement and empowering uh, the people that you work with that serves servant leadership, uh, if you will. So uh, examples of that have been having to, you know, with launching any type of guided pathways um, is an example. AB705 is an example. I, I worked with called in faculty, called in classified professionals and, and leadership, management and supervisors to talk about these approaches and what they needed from me in order for us to come together and, and collectively address um, and advance these initiatives so that we are uh, strengthening our institution, supporting our students. Um, I, I can think of um, going to, to numerous uh, training, you know, what type of training is needed? I think the profession, professional development, um, some of the things I spoke to earlier uh, speak to being a servant leader as well. Where, where is it that I can provide those opportunities um, to our, our staff and faculty and students um, to, to encourage, to inspire, to um, provide them um, the learning they need, the tools they need to be successful in their roles so that we can all come together and address those, those um, tasks ahead of us. I, I hope that speaks to it. It really is about being a servant leader um, and empowering the people around you. Thank you, Dr. Hancock. Second question. Our college has, rich, has a richly diverse body of students, including a large incarcerated student population, traditional as well as online students, and a growing dual enrolled high school population. Later questions will address some of these segments specifically. The key question here is how do you plan to unite all Saracoso Community College around a shared vision for student success and equitably allocate funding to prioritize and respect the needs of our communities. All right, well, unity comes with engagement, with inclusion. Uh, I think um, we have to have everyone at the table um, from all the various sites, um, you know, there's, uh, I think you've got six, we count online. You've got to, to bring in people from all these different, and then each, each site um, has its own unique perspective, its own unique needs. So when you're talking about allocating funding, well, what are their specific needs? It's not gonna be the same for each area, uh, especially three plus hours apart from, from each other, uh, different communities, different um, workforce needs. Um, different student demographics, all of that. Um, just like we were mentioning, the incarcerated was was a lead into the, in that question. Um, dual enrolled students. So all of these have very unique needs and and different funding needs as well. And so I think that one you have to have everyone needs to be part of this because we are one college. Um, that's something that that I've uh, currently been really working with uh, at. at in my current role is bringing the two colleges together and saying we're one district as well. So there's, there's some spillover here um, where we have to recognize that we're all part of Saracoso Community College. We all contribute in our own unique way and we should all be at the table and understand what the other people at the other sites, what it is they're doing, what are their needs, what are their challenges, and so that we better understand when we're allocating those funding sources that we're doing so collectively with a shared understanding of each other's needs. And, and I think if you have the buy-in as a collective, uh, um, then, then it's a lot less, well, why did they get this or, you know, versus me getting what I wanted. I, I think if we come together and make sure that we understand our unique challenges and what we face and, and we start to prioritize around that. I know there's a prioritization process um, around all of that, but it really comes from educating one another about our, our particular contribution to the college as a whole. Um, Dr. Hancock, how would you address developing a culture of community with our faculty, staff, and students? 
presence, um, I think, is one of the first things that comes to mind. You have to be present. You have to be available um, also, uh, willing to sit down and have conversations with people. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're in a very different environment now. So, uh, you know, I would say that open door policy has always been something I live by. If I'm not in a meeting, um, I'm available. If I'm not on the phone, I'm available. Um, so if somebody, a student, a staff member, faculty member, somebody um, wants to pop by and say hello, I would. But now we're in a new environment. So uh, we were just talking about this earlier. So I, uh, outside of Zoom bombing, you know, if I'm <laughs> in a meeting, it, it's, it's, um, it's a little more challenging. You have to kind of establish and set up these meetings. But I think that making sure that I, I am reaching out, uh, especially during this time during the remote, era uh, that, that I'm at least making this, this attempt to get out and uh, virtually to get to know people, connect with them, know that they can connect with me. And I think once they see that I'm responsive, that's another piece is you need to be responsive. And that's calls and emails and um, questions, all of those things um, and follow up. I think that that's, that's part of all, all of that. So. I, I think that that's how you build that community is, is just being, becoming part of it. <laughs> it's, um, it's not me and you, it's us, so. Thank you. What is your experience with classified staff representation and involvement in a college governance process? You said that was classified? There's a specific to classified? Mm -hmm. We all have a vital role in serving our students. Everybody um, on, on campus has a vital role. And so as far as classified professionals, they're just as vital as ever. They keep everything running for us. Um, they keep, they get people in the door, they get people fed, they get people housing ref references, they get, they address so many of the needs of our students so they can focus on the learning um, that takes place in the classroom or via Zoom or, or, or Canvas, whatever modality uh, that is. But it, classified professionals are extremely important. I value them. I have a very strong connection um, with CSEA leadership is on the labor side and then the, uh, uh, the um, classified Senate as well. And so I, I think it's just important. Again, it's like being there um, being listening, understanding, um, bringing them to the table, um, and and that recognition that of their role in the success of, of the students in our institution as a whole. So I've done that. It's really about the relationship building, and you're probably going to hear that a lot in my responses because I, I I'm driven by relationships. That's how I function. It, it's about forming those relationships, that sense of trust, um, understanding. Um, where I'm coming from. I'm very transparent and um, I just want people to know why decisions are made and why we're going in a particular direction and you do that by bringing people to the table, valuing their um, contribution, their opinions, their perspectives. Um, and, and so all of that applies to all groups, but I know sometimes that, that classified professionals may feel a little left out um, and, and I've seen that. Um, but I, I make a concerted effort to make sure to bring them in um, because of their importance. Communication is an ongoing challenge for Saracosa Community College. What would be your strategy to increase or enhance the quality of our communication? Communication. <laughs> um, could you read that first, the very first sentence again? I'm sorry. Oh, you're muted. Uh, communication is an ongoing challenge for Saracosa Community College. What would be your strategy to increase or enhance the quality of our communication? Yeah, yeah I heard communication and then I heard communication, communicate, and the first word that comes to mind when I think of communication is the challenge with communication. Um, what are those communication channels? I think that um, it sounds a little formal, but mapping out communication channels um, who's responsible for communicating what and to whom? I think making that very clear 
I, I don't think that many institutions have done that or really thought that through in a more detailed fashion. Um, there's different modes of, of communication as well um, that don't, aren't always as effective as, as other modes of communication. I'm the type of person, and again, I hate, I hate to make references to um, you know, face-to-face on-ground operations uh, in a virtual world, um, but, but this is, can be adapted to, to our, our new world. Um, but, but popping in um, and, and uh, making sure that um, we bring people together, um, talk about you know, those, those very specific communication. I'm a face-to-face, -face, where I was going with that is I'm a face-to-face -face interaction type person. Um, emails don't really convey a message or they, they take on a tone. Um, there's problems in that area. There's, um, I think, again, understanding who's responsible for various types of communication. Um, but we've got to um, bring people in. I know with so many sites and being so far spread out that oftentimes there's a, there's a sense. I, I know Needles, um, the Needles Center, when I worked at Palo Verde College, you know, it's like out of sight right you know so you have to be very cautious and, and be intentional about making sure that they're included in every meeting every decision um, that they're all the communications are broadcast and that they're participating in the development of those communications as well but I, it is a challenge for every organization you will see this and, and continue to see it as a challenge it's one of the biggest challenges for institutions i think um, but like I said, I think being intentional and really um, mapping out what that should look like and those responsibilities will help um, with communication and, in, and even identifying the types and the modalities in which we, we uh, communicate. How would you help us to attract new students and increase enrollment at the college's numerous and diverse sites where programs and services are delivered? So increasing new students. So, so where, where are those opportunities at the various sites? I, I think that they're, and they are gonna be different as you know. Um, you know, what are the workforce needs in those communities? There's gotta be a value proposition for the student. You know, why, why, do, why am I gonna put all this time and energy and money um, and, and take away time with my family um, and, and make all these sacrifices? What, what's the value in doing that? Um, you know, what are the, going to be those outcomes? Is it a better job? Am I going to transfer? What, what, what is it that I'm looking for? Specific types of training. Um, so I think we need to identify that in each different area. Uh, I've noticed in some areas there's a significant dual enrollment, uh, just going off the charts. Others are more flat. I think looking at the, those opportunities, um, are there reasons? where we, uh, or opportunities to increase, continue to increase dual enrollment in some of the other areas, learning from those that are, that are taking off. Um, uh, there's the incarcerated student population, which you have continuously been increasing the numbers you're serving uh, in that way. And, and I think, so, so what are those programs? Um, what are the services they need to continue to be successful? Oftentimes the, the incarcerated students outperform um, in some of our general population, but uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know if that's something you've experienced, but it was something we experienced at Palo Verde College. Uh, so I think just really getting to know the communities, each, each individual community and what those opportunities are, um, and are we meeting the needs of the students? Is, is there that value um, for the student, like to make all those sacrifices I mentioned and come to school. So if we can answer that question, the students will come to us um, and, if, and make sure that we're providing them the services they need in that specific environment uh, to be successful. So, so I think that those are the things, those, when those come together, the students will, will come, come to us. Um, but we've got to show them that we, we are here um, to, to, to help them to help them be successful and for them to complete and accomplish that goal. How would your experience inform the ways you would cultivate buy-in from all constituent groups in developing and implementing a guided pathways program across the college's expansive service area? 
So cultivate culture of buy-in. I, I think, again, that's inclusion. Uh, everyone, Guided Pathways is everything. I, I mean, it touches every single thing we do. Um, if you're truly engaged in Guided Pathways, um, you know, those four pillars cover everything. And, and so I, I think that it's important that we're making sure that each um, various site, uh, every program, every service area, that they see where they fit into Guided Pathways. Um, faculty are, are very clear on, on meta majors and, and program mapping and some of the work that takes place in that area. I know, you're, you, know you have a lot around onboarding and looking at those processes as students um, get on the path. So there's the identify the path, you know, um, clarify the path, get them on the path, keep them on the path. That's everybody, again. Um, everybody is involved in keeping the students on that path. And so we've got our student services folks and faculty are part of that as well. I mean, there's no one group um, that, it, that it's exclusive to when you're talking guided pathways. So I think you've got to communicate to each group. You've got to have them see themselves um, as a participant in guided pathways and the benefit to guided pathways. They need to understand that. They need to build trust and relationships between all the different departments and their roles so that everyone ex um, uh, respects each other's um, role within all those different pieces um, that I said, you know, it touches everything. Uh, so, but I think um, oftentimes we, I talk about this um, when I talk about vision alignment and mission alignment. Every single individual needs to understand how they contribute. Um, and it's, it's so important. So, so I, same thing for this. Every site, every individual, every department and division, um, you need to bring them in, uh, make sure that they, you know, that's where you get the buy-in. Once people understand um, why we're doing this, what are, what's some of the outcomes? What have we seen and recognized? What are some of those best practices that have worked out at other institutions? Maybe some of them may not work at Saracosta Community College, but we can adapt or find ones that do. Uh, that's where that innovation comes in and, and looking and adapting and taking risks, um, all of those things. But I think once people understand um, that this is something, that it's a movement, right? It's not an initiative. Um, they talk about a framework. It's a movement. And Guided Pathways is equity. When you look at all those different best practices that they, they're building in, it's, it's about equity. And, and I know we're all around equity. We, we can all gather around that. So how does Guided Pathways advance equity? So I think making those connections to, to those other um, things that we're committed to, I think helps create that buy-in as well. Now, speaking of equity, what is your plan to support our employees embracing equity, diversity, and inclusion? So as far as I know that there's work that's taken place around professional development, I also know there were some cuts to that. Um, but I think that finding ways to bring people in, it's really about um, everyone understanding, like I talked about that journey a little bit, the one, my personal journey around um, equity and, and inclusion. Uh, I, I think that, you know, you have to create space. Um, I've had numerous discussions recently, and this is something that uh, I'm on the board with the Association of California Community College Administrators as well. And, and something we're talking about in all our presentations and in, in everything we do, we want to create space. Um, some of the best uh, conversations happen um, off the cuff as a result of some of the other things you're presenting or talking on. So you need to build in that space um, when you're presenting on, on various topics. Um, you know, improve the cultural awareness and responsiveness and, and, and what are the actions we're taking. But I think you have to create a supportive, safe environment if you're going to have those very tough conversations. Um, people need to understand it's a safe place. No one's out to get anyone. What can we do collectively to truly um, break down these long established barriers to student success, especially for our, our students of color? So, so I, I think that um, 
you know, increasing diversity of staff and faculty and administration, that's all hugely important as well. But it's also, um, there's gotta be some responsibility taken uh, by uh, myself and my white colleagues too, to reflect and see where have we been part of the problem or how do we dismantle our own biases or those institutional uh, barriers that have been created over time. So, so we have a responsibility. You can't just rely on those that have been committed out of survival. Um, it's, you know, we have to be, be good allies uh, and understand ourselves as well and, and taking that, that approach. So I, I think it's, again, just to circle back around on that, it's about um, creating that space for people to, to, to grow, to, to learn uh, and to act. Um, you know, and dismantle these these institutional barriers that have been in existence for so long. And, and by doing all of that, we can reduce those equity gaps, um, you know, and, and improve transfer awareness that support completion, all those things that are listed in your, your equity plan strategies. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it, it starts with each of us individually and then collectively um, if we're going to truly uh, make a difference. Share with us the most successful example of leading external collaboration. In effect, beyond your campus boundaries, what process did you use and what was the outcome? So external collaboration. One of the things that I that I mentioned that, that just comes to mind. Well, there's outside the institution. It's with the institution, but out um, outside the institution. When I talk about working with the California Department of um, uh, um, the CDCR, sometimes I can't even think of what the acronyms stand for. Uh, Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. There we go. Uh, working with them, the state leaders um, to provide services. Um, we the ebooks. We were huge users. Of, of our, the e-readers uh, that, that, that um, students were using to some success, um, but advocation, advocating for that, um, the face-to-face -face, um, partnership and, and the, creating that collaboration with the local prisons um, to provide that face-to-face, -face, what programs we're offering uh, our students is, is another piece of that collaboration. Um, those ISAs um, with field and, and with um, the Industrial Emergency Council, that's a lot of external collaboration, especially with the um, Industrial Emergency Council because they're offering classes up and down the state in other districts that don't offer those courses through us. And so I had to reach out and collaborate with other, other community college districts to allow them to come into that district and provide those firefighters with continuing education training through us. And uh, so that, that was a lot of uh, back and forth and letter writing and, and phone calls and, um, and working with our, our, our groups as well and uh, Industrial Emergency Council uh, in negotiating you know, uh, that ISA. Uh, so I was also participated in that. Uh, I was the lead developer in the um, dual enrollment agreement um, with um, Mountain Empire Unified School District recently. They're, they're a small, very rural um, high school. Uh, well, they're a school district, but the, their high school is way east um, of, of um, most of the San Diego County, um, just before you go up into the mountains. Um, so I worked with their superintendent and their high school principal uh, to come to terms around that, that CCAP agreement, formalized courses that they had been offering in a different, um, uh, under a different um, agreement. Uh, and uh, so we formalized that, added some additional courses and, and got that uh, through the board. And so that's another piece of, uh, and I, I talked about um, through adult Ted working with the Fort Mojave Indian tribe. Um, so that's some of the things um, to, to create a certificate in culinary whereby uh, they, they have the casinos. And so that, that lab portion where they would actually be working in the kitchen, 
Um, needles, again, very, very, very small. I think their population is 5,000. So our center there, um, you know, we can't build a culinary lab. So we partnered with, with the Fort Mojave Indian tribe to, to offer those classes, uh, the lab classes over there uh, at their um, facility. Uh, at, at the kitchen in one of the casinos. So I think that there's, um, I have lots of examples of uh, specific examples of collaborating uh, with external organizations. Uh, the Workforce uh, Alliance in Stanislaus County when I was in Modesto with San Joaquin Valley College, uh, I, I was on several committees and boards uh, with them uh, and they um, funded training. That was under the WIA uh, Workforce Investment Act, and so we had agreements to provide training um, with uh, that they would forward their, the students over to us and pay for their their education. Um, uh, the Employment Development Department, I worked with them to also have them bring students uh, or um, refer students um, to us also. And so those are some of the other things. We, we had the EDD actually come on campus at Palo Verde College. So their office moved up to the actual college campus. Um, uh, I'm not sure how that's uh, working out now that they, we brought athletics back. Uh, I still say we sometimes. Uh, Palo Verde College, I, I helped to develop the curriculum to, to bring athletics back there. That, that's off topic though. Um, but the first time in decades that they've had athletics. Um, it just happened to come to mind. But yeah, working with the Employment Development Department um, to also serve our students. So uh, lots more examples, Chamber of Commerce, um, you know, Rotary Club. Uh, you know, I worked with a, a Rotary Club member to uh, get a grant for the Ag Program uh, certificate um, that we had at Palo Verde College. And so we were able to get a small grant to help buy uh, uh, supplies and for labs um, for our ag program. So uh, another example of some, some external collaboration, but really working with the local employers on, on their needs. Sorry, I, I know you just started to unmute and then I started talking again. <laughs> Beyond addressing the impact of COVID-19, what do you see as the college's biggest challenges going forward and what is your plan for addressing them? One of the biggest challenges, the uncertainty, um, I think that we're all facing right now. Um, so there's that uncertainty, there's the financial impact of COVID-19. I know there's a lot of, um, there's the CARES Act funding and how much of that can we apply, then there's the state put in the budget, some additional money and a block grant uh, for, to mitigate uh, the impact on learning. There's, so, so that financial piece is big, especially with us not ever knowing really where we're landing with regard to um, whether or not the state's gonna fully fund us or not. And now there's the deferrals and all of those things. And so, and that's all a, as a result of COVID-19 and having such that $54 billion impact on, on our economy in California. So how are we doing that? I mentioned that a little bit in my opening statement, you know, uh, assessing that, uh, how are we responding to, to those challenges while still meeting the needs of our, our students um, and, and making sure that we're applying what resources we have to make sure we, that we have that continuity of operations. Um, being in a remote environment, how, how, how well are we, have we adapted to serving our students remotely uh, for our student services? I think that we need to make sure that, that there's as, as minimal an impact as possible with regard to, to in providing them those services that, they, that we were be able to provide them when we were um, on campus or on site. So, so I think that um, that assessment of the, the impact and, and how we're addressing that, and, and I think just the um, there's an emotional impact. I, I think we need to support each other and our students. Um, you know, there's everything that's happening in, in people's lives, especially in our students' lives, job losses, all these things that are happening as, as a result. So we need to um, look and see how we can step up our game a little bit to make sure that we're addressing uh, any of those concerns, depression, uh, you know, any of the mental health issues that may arise out of this uh, pandemic. 
So, uh, so those are some of the things I think we need to do. We just, and we have to evaluate it on a regular basis because one day we're reopening and the next minute we're not. Um, so how I, fortunately for Saracosa Community College, you had such a large online population. And so, so the impact wasn't felt maybe as hard. I know it's been hard, but at maybe as hard as some uh, institutions that didn't, don't have such a robust online presence. Um, so you already are a step ahead in that regard because you've already figured out how to deliver services and, and, and to students. But I, I think that for those that, that have um, been doing this out of, off the campus or at the sites, it's been a real challenge. So I just want to make sure that we, we get together, we come together and talk about the challenges, address those, um, and, and make sure that we're, we're meeting those needs of students and each other. Um, we have to meet our own needs. Working from home is very different than, than going into our office uh, every day. I've actually been going into my office um, most days lately, even though I'm alone, um, just because of the ease of performing the work there. Uh, so I get it. Um, and, you know, do we have the necessary tools and support for our employees to be successful in meeting the students' needs in this remote environment? So I, I think that is ongoing assessment is the key. Given the time, this may be the last question before you do your closing statement. So <clears throat> several questions regarding athletics were submitted as it relates to the student-centered funding formula metrics, equity and student development. How would you show your support for Coyote Athletics and other student activities? I talked a little bit about being um, attending events, being you know engaged with the student leadership and, and athlete. And I spoke a little bit about athletics, even though it was out of context <laughs> um, when I was talking about the uh, EDD. So, you, just to 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 highlight my support for athletics, I, I think that um, it brings the community together. It, it gives them something to come to to root for. Um, come together around, um, you know, Palo Verde College, again, I said, hadn't had athletics for decades. Um, you know, that had gone away a long time ago. And um, we made the decision to, to work on bringing back athletics. And, and right now it's basketball, men's and women's basketball. And so I helped where I worked with, I was on the curriculum committee, um, uh, co-chair. And so we work to develop the curriculum, put that together for the conditioning and for the actual uh, athletics program. Developed all of that, worked through it. Um, um, they have an uh, athletics director now uh, there um, to help since they've actually begun the program now uh, since I've left. Um, but th my commitment to was, it was before Palo Verde um, in the city of Blythe, they would have practically shut down around homecoming at the high school. And, and everything shut down during the county fair. Those were the two biggies um, in, in Blythe. Um, and I was like, we're missing something here. We've got to have people excited and wanting to come up to the college. Uh, when I say up to the college, we were on the Mesa just above town. So I, Athletics is important to bringing people um, together and, and, you know, sitting in a game and rooting for ever, you know, rooting for your home team, right? Um, there's something to that. That's why um, sports is such a huge franchise in our country. And so we need to, we need to bring everyone together around being a coyote. Um, and, um, you know, I look forward to the opportunity to being a coyote and, and wearing my regalia. Uh, when I say regalia, I mean, athletic regalia <laughs> and uh, rooting for the teams. Um, I think being present, I think um, also demonstrates support, but then there's also, you know, working with your, your directors and uh, coaches and everyone else um, to make sure that we can continue these programs, uh, that we can fund these programs and, uh, you know, recognizing the importance of them to not just our students that are playing these sports and attracting them, but to the community as a whole. Okay. Well, very good. And so now we are into your last five minute concluding remarks. Uh, if you would go right ahead, tell me when you're ready. 
<laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and begin and try not to use my hands as much for this part. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in closing, I, I just, I want people to know, I want all of you to, to know that I'm looking to establish roots um, uh, to become part of, of the community, both on and off campus and within the diverse communities throughout the vast service area, really connect with everybody, make a home there. Um, I really, um, one of the things that attracted me to this position is the longevity uh, of the presidents within the district there. And, you know, Jill Board recently, you know, 10 years, over 10 years as president. Um, so that's, that's a great legacy, um, you know, that there's, there's stability there. There's a, a sense of community and importance and becoming part of the institution uh, that, I, that I would value um, should I be honored with, with the position. Um, you know, I, I came to the community, my spouse and I visited Ridgecrest, drove around town, looked at housing and neighborhoods, had lunch. Um, yeah, uh, my spouse, he's already looking in, at the area churches. And, and since he's from France originally, he was, he was wondering if there was a French restaurant. And lo and behold, you have one, Mon Rev. Uh, so unfortunately, they weren't open while we were there. Um, but I have a passion for education uh, and, and its power to transform lives. And I, as I hope I've conveyed, I've led successful efforts in program development aligned with local workforce needs lasting community partnerships, student-centered approach to decision-making, commitment to meeting students where they are, that's that equity work, empowering faculty, staff, and students to realize their potential. And I understand the challenges and as well as the unique strengths of rural communities. Um, Saracosa is engaged in the very type of work that I championed about Calvary College, and, and I look forward to carrying that on. Um, I have the background experience, I think, that demonstrate my values are aligned with those of Saracosa Community College, those to educate, innovate, inspire, and serve. And that is my leadership style. And, and I believe that I can contribute to Saracosa's mission to improve the life of every student that serves. So I just wanna say it's been an honor and privilege to have this time with you this evening. And I look forward to a future engagement. Thank you very much, Dr. Hancock, for your time and being with us this evening. Um, so, and let me also say to the audience again, please, please log in to saracosocollege.com and please provide your input on the candidates. Uh, we'd appreciate that very much. And uh, Dr. Hancock, um, I think we will see you next week and we wish you well. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank same, you. Very thank you. Same to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.